Good evening. Let's open tonight's service with hymn number 40 from your hardback hymnals, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Let's all stand together, number 40. Let's open our Bibles together to Psalm 141, 141. <clears throat> uh, Janelle had back surgery today. It was uh, arthroscopic, and she should be home by now, um, but she'll be recovering from that for a few days. So I remember to pray for Janelle. <clears throat> Psalm 141, Lord, I cry unto thee, make haste unto me. Give ear unto my voice when I cry unto thee. Let my prayer be set before thee as incense and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. Incline not my heart to any evil thing, to practice wicked works, 
with men that work iniquity, and let me not eat of their dainties. Let the righteous smite me. Let the righteous smite me? Yeah. That means to be corrected by your brother, be corrected by the gospel. Let the righteous smite me, and it shall be a kindness. And let him reprove me. It shall be an excellent oil which shall not break my head. For yet my prayer also shall be in their calamities. When their judges are overthrown in stony places, they shall hear my words, for they are sweet. Our bones are scattered at the grave's mouth. (laughs) You know your bones are scattered at the grave's mouth right now. Yeah. We're just one step away from the grave, aren't we? Our bones, our bones are scattered at the grave's mouth as when one cutteth and cleaveth wood upon the earth. But mine eyes are upon thee, O God, the Lord. In thee is my trust. Leave not my soul destitute. Keep me from the snares which they have laid for me and the gins of the workers of iniquity. Let the wicked fall into their own nets whilst that I, with all, escape. Let's pray. Oh, our merciful, gracious, loving Heavenly Father, how desperate we are for you to provide that way of escape. That we might be able to bear the troubles of this flesh and this world. Lord, we we need for you to turn us this hour. Enable us to, to look to Christ, to rest in him, to believe on him. And Lord, to rejoice in all that he's accomplished, knowing that thy hand hath provided everything necessary for our salvation and for our life. Lord, enable us to worship. Send your spirit and power. Open my mouth and enable me to speak and open our hearts and our ears. Enable us to hear thy voice. Lord, open your word. Make it sharp and powerful, effectual. Lord, we thank you for our sister Janelle, and we ask that your hand of strength and healing would be upon her. We pray that you'd give her extra grace in this time of need and draw her heart near to thee and give her full recovery from this surgery. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand together again. We'll sing hymn number 39 from the choir. Condemned and dying, guilty I deserve God's wrath. Long I fought against my master, hell bent I was courting death. But the blood of Christ had bought me. I and I. At the time which was predestined in the covenant of God's grace, God in mercy sent his spirit, blessed time of love and grace. To great merit as the sinner substitute 
healed. I saw Jesus bleeding, dying, suffering as my substitute. Precious blood for sins atonement, justice could not ask for more. I heard Christ cry, it is finished, and I could resist no more. Thanks to God for intervening, grace that broke my stubborn Let me perish, grace that rescued me from hell. Sovereign grace, I will proclaim it, irresistible and free. Grace that chose me and redeemed me. By grace alone saved me. Sinner, now you've heard my story. Now I bid you trust my God. Christ, my all sufficient Savior, saves poor sinners by his blood. Please be seated. open your Bibles with me to Psalm 1. Psalm 1. The Lord has directed my heart the last few days to read through the book of Psalms. And um, as he enables us, we'll plan to try to bring a message from a psalm on Wednesday nights for however long the Lord allows us to do that. And it just impressed me in reading through all the Psalms, what a, a summary of all that's in the book of Psalms is in these six short verses of Psalm 1. And I've titled this message, The Blessed Man. The Blessed Man. These Psalms reveal the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed is the man. He is the man. And uh, our blessings are to be found in him. That's, you know, you, you hear people say all the time, well, God bless you. God bless you. They, you know, you sneeze. Somebody say, God bless you. And I know they're just trying to be polite, but I want to say to them, he already has. He already has. <laughs> He's put me in Christ and all the blessings that Christ deserved from the Father for his faithfulness. We just sang about that. I enjoy by virtue of the fact that I'm in him. And all the blessings of God, all the blessings of God, all the promises of God are yea and amen in him. Now Psalm 1 identifies the blessed man. Psalm 2 speaks of the Lord's anointed. Psalm 3 speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ crying out to the Father from the cross to save him. In Psalm 4, ye sons of men, how long, how long will you turn my glory to shame? It's what we do every time we sin, don't we? We turn his glory into shame. Deliver me from my enemies, Psalm 5. In Psalm 6, my bones are vexed within me. Now that's just the first six psalms, and they all speak of Christ. They are the Lord Jesus Christ speaking. And if he's pleased to reveal that to us, then we can find hope of being found in him then we'll understand how the Lord speaks to our hearts 
through these psalms as well. But first and foremost, yeah, I, I can remember in religion, you know, we talk about messianic psalms. Uh, and there were, certain, there were certain individual psalms that related to Christ. Well, and, I, and generally speaking, those were psalms that were so clearly related to New Testament events that even an unbeliever could see it. But if we're going to see Christ in all the scriptures and in all the psalms as he is, as he is in the volume of the book, it is written of me. You remember in Luke chapter 24 when the Lord went to the upper room and met with the disciples and the scripture says, and beginning with Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, he expounded unto, those, unto them those things concerning himself. This book is about Christ. And if the Lord enables us to set our affections on him and to see him, to rest in him and to believe on him, We'll have peace, we'll have comfort, we'll have strength, we'll have his grace and his glory. The Lord Jesus Christ is the holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, Savior. And uh, that's our hope, isn't it? Our hope is, Lord, show me thy ways. Show me thy ways. Show me Christ. Give me children lest I die. Lord, reveal yourself to me. He is the man. You see that in verse 1? Blessed, blessed, blessed of God is the man. He's the God man. The scripture says that there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. One mediator. That's why the Lord was able to say, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father but by me. To know me is to have life. To know me is to have salvation. I, uh, salvation is of the Lord. I am your salvation. I am your salvation. He is the last Adam. But I want you to notice in our text, in Psalm 1, verse 1, there are two words in the Hebrew language for man. Uh, one word is the word Adam, and um, Adam, when not speaking of the particular man Adam, is generally used to refer to mankind, um, and so there's no reference to gender when the word Adam is used. The other word, on the other hand, is the word ish, and it's always used in reference to a male. It always has identification of a man in contrast with a woman. And so these blessings are for men and women. There's no question about it. But if we're going to enjoy the blessings of God, we're going to have to be found in the man. The man. <laughs> the man, Christ Jesus. What did Pilate say after scourging our Lord and standing before the crowd? Behold the man. Oh, that God would give us grace to behold the man. If we can see the man, we'll be blessed in the man. And then what did, uh, in that parable, the Lord gave um, about uh, uh, the, the, the king that was, had the son ruling. And what they say, we'll not have this man reign over us. We're not going to do it. And, uh, and that's, the, that's the difference. And that's what this psalm does. Look at, look at verse, uh, verse 4. The ungodly are not sore. So this, these six short verses distinguish the difference between those who are blessed in the man and those who will not bow to the man. That's it. And, and, it, and it shows the distinction. You know, the world, the world loves to make lots of different categories for people, don't they? Uh, you've got different races and different genders and different things, you know, that people use to, um, to identify people, pigeonhole people. But in fact, there's only two kinds of people. There's those who are blessed in the man and those who raise their fist in rebellion against the man. 
And that's it. Blessed is this man. (laughs) He's blessed of God. He's called uh, the one who is anointed with the oil of gladness above his fellows. The Christ. He came in the full power of the Spirit of God. Blessed of the Father. Blessed of the Father. All power has been given unto me in heaven and in earth. I've been been given all authority. And what did they say? Never man spake like this man before. He speaks with one having authority, not as the scribes. He doesn't just... He doesn't just uh, give pious platitudes and doctrine and theology and philosophy. He he speaks with authority. When he speaks, we're, we're captivated by what he says. Why? Because he's blessed of God. He's blessed with the full anointing of the Spirit of God. He has the approval of the Father. This is my beloved Son. In him I'm well pleased. Blessed is this man. He's been blessed of God. And the only hope that you and I have to be blessed of God is to be found in him. If we're not in him, there's no blessings. All the blessings of God are in Christ. He's the one that God blessed. He's the one that God was pleased with. He's the one that that, that satisfied all the demands of the Father and fulfilled the law perfectly. He was rewarded for his work. He was. (laughs) He was given his rightful place at the right hand of the majesty on high. He returned back into glory and took with him the names of those he lived and died for. And he was rewarded with children. His quiver is full. (laughs) He was rewarded from the father with a wife. A wife that is as beautiful as he is. A wife that's as perfect and righteous as he is. He was rewarded, blessed of God, because he was faithful. Faithful. Know what we just said about his faithfulness. Blessed is the man. Why was he blessed? Because he walked not in the counsel of Of the ungodly. Why would he? (laughs) Why would wisdom seek counsel from ungodly? (laughs) God has made him to be our wisdom. All our righteousness. All our sanctification. And all our redemption. Everything that we have from God is found in him. He is wisdom personified. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 14. Turn with me there to Proverbs chapter 8. Verse 1. Let's begin there. Doth not wisdom cry? (laughs) Now he's not crying out in the streets. He's not begging men to let him have his way. But he did cry out to the father. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Wisdom has cried and understanding has put forth her voice. She standeth in the top of the high places by the way in the places of the path. She crieth at the gates at the entry of the city, at the coming into the doors. Unto you, O men, I call. That's the effectual call. He's not, he's not pleading with men. He's calling effectually. And when he does, my voice is to the sons of men. O ye simple Understand wisdom, and ye fools, be you of an understanding heart. Hear, for I will speak of excellent things, and the opening of my lips shall be right things. How does God speak? Well, he speaks by his word. 
He speaks by his word. For my mouth shall speak truth and wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the words of my mouth are in righteousness. There is nothing forward or perverse in them. They are all plain, plain to him that understandeth and right to them that find knowledge. And then look down at verse 14. Counsel is mine. Now what does Psalm 1 say? The blessed man, the Lord Jesus Christ, walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Why would he seek counsel from ungodly when he himself is wisdom? Counsel is mine and sound wisdom. I am understanding. I have strength. (laughs) I have no need to go anywhere else. And if the Lord's put us in Christ, we have no need to go anyplace else. We have no need to go anyplace else. Why would we, why would we seek counsel from someone who doesn't know God when he is our counselor? When he has all wisdom? Romans chapter 11, verse 33. Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his ways. And his judgments are past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? And who hath been his counselor? Who's going to counsel God? He walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. He has perfect knowledge, perfect wisdom. Who hath first given to him that he shall recompense unto him again? For of him and through him and to him are all things. To him be all the glory. He walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. If you're in Christ, you have no reason to seek counsel from anyone else. You've got wisdom. Who knows the mind of God? We have the mind of Christ. We have the truth of God right here in his word. We don't have to go anywhere else. He said in Psalm 50, if I were hungry, I would not tell thee. For the world is mine and the fullness thereof. I've got no need from you. You've got every need of me. The ungodly did try to counsel the Lord Jesus Christ. Beginning with his own mother. Now outside of Christ, we're all ungodly. I know that Mary was blessed of God. But at 12 years old, she was not able to counsel her son. She rebuked him for not, for not telling. Woman, who are you to rebuke me? <laughs> Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? You, 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 you're, not, you're not here. Men, men have always tried to. In Mark chapter 8, the scripture says that the Lord was spoke plainly to the disciples about his death. At which point, Peter rebuked him. Said, Lord, it's not going to be that way. And what did the Lord say to Peter? Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things of God, but the things of man. Men tried to counsel him. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. He didn't listen to what they said. Even those who loved him the most, even those who were nearer to, nearest to him. And that's true of his children yet today, isn't it? How many times we go to God and try to counsel him. Lord, this is the way you should do it. This is the way you ought to do it. Oh, Lord, forgive us. You walk not in the counsel of the ungodly. Lord, I'm in need of hearing from you, not you from me. Teach me, teach me, Lord, thy ways. 
And then, of course, his enemies tried to counsel him. <laughs> Show us a miracle and we'll believe you. No, it's a wicked and perverse generation that seeketh after a sign. I'm not going to do it your way. I'm, I'm taking my orders from the Father. <laughs> I walk not in the counsel of the ungodly. And then those thieves on the cross, they tried to, they tried to counsel him, didn't they? If thou be the Son of God, save thyself and us. <laughs> I am the Son of God. And I'm going to save one of you. I'm going to save you through my death. I'm not taking my counsel from the ungodly. The Lord Jesus Christ is wisdom personified. He is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Everything we need to know, we learn from him. Everything we'll ever know about God, we'll learn from him. And so he says, blessed is that man who walks not in the counsel of, he never walked in the counsel of the ungodly. How many times we do, and every time we do, we lose sight of that blessing, don't we? Because he is the blessing. Christ is the blessing. Blessing is not, is not uh, having a, your circumstances changed or having a life of ease or having a, you know, a, a, a sudden income boost or whatever. You know, people think that those are blessings. No, not necessarily. He is the blessing. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. But looking to Christ alone for all my wisdom the world and all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, everything that man looks to for blessings. See, man thinks he's blessed. <laughs> With a perverse mind, supposing the gain is godliness, he thinks he's blessed because, he's, because he's, he's prosperous or he's popular or because he's got power or because he's enjoying the pleasures of the world. He thinks those are blessings. Blessings of God are all in Christ. They're all in Him. And you and I, we can, have, we can have blessings beyond comprehension, beyond measure, in the midst of the most difficult circumstances. He walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, and he standeth, not in the way of sinners. What is the way of a sinner? There is a way that seems right unto man, but in the end that way leads to death, isn't it? That man, man's ways, well, we saw that Sunday. My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. As the heavens are high above the earth, so are my thoughts above your thoughts. He walketh or standeth not in the way of sinners. No, contrary to that, he is the way. <laughs> he is the way. Turn with me to Acts chapter 24. The way of man is free will. That's just, that's just what man, man just believes that. He believes it. He's been sent a strong delusion and he's believed the lie. He believes that he has the power in his own will to determine the destiny of his immortal soul. He believes it. He thinks, well, I'll come to God when I get ready to come to God. He walks not in the way of sinners. Walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, stands, he stands not in the way of sinners. And those who are blessed in him don't stand there either, do they? <laughs> if you've been blessed in Christ, you know your salvation didn't have anything to do with your will. You know it didn't have anything to do with your works. You know it didn't have anything to do with your wisdom. You know that it was all because he did everything for you. You know that because he was blessed of the Father, you enjoyed those blessings 
by free grace. Free grace. In Acts chapter 24, the Jews took Paul and drug him before the, the governor of Judea, Felix, and uh, accused him of being an insurrectionist. They accused him of trying to overthrow the Roman government. And, uh, and Paul stands to defend himself and declares clearly to Felix that these accusations are not true. They're not true. I am not an insurrectionist. I, might, you know, I know my Lord and his kingdom is not of this world. And he has called me to a life of, of respect and obedience to those governing authorities. <laughs> he wrote that himself, didn't he, in Romans chapter 15. You know, that, that's, 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 not, that's not what I'm here for. Those accusations they're making against me, Felix, are not true. However, they have made one accusation against me that is true. They're accusing me of heresy. <laughs> and look what he says. In verse 14, but this I confess unto thee, that after the way, which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. <laughs> they say, I'm following after the way. I'm following after the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm looking to him. For all my salvation, I'm looking to his successful work of redemption. I'm looking to his obedience to the law. I'm looking to his shed blood and the justifying work of grace that he accomplished on Calvary's cross. I'm looking to Christ alone. And they call me a heresy. They call me a heretic because I'm doing that. And what they call heresy, they heard me clearly. By that which they called me heresy, that way I worship God believing everything that's written in the law and in the prophets. Now, when he speaks of law here, he's not speaking of the Ten Commandments. He's speaking of the whole of Scripture. In the volume of the book, it is written in me. What did the Lord say to those Pharisees? You, you search the Scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life, but these are they which testify of me. And so he said, I... I know that everywhere I go in the scriptures, it's pointing me to Christ. Pointing me to Christ. That's why Paul said, we, we profess to know nothing among you save Christ and him crucified. We're just going to preach the Lord Jesus Christ because he is the way. We're not going to make our own way. We're not going to satisfy the demands of the law. We're, we're going to look to Christ. And in looking to him, we're not going to walk. We're not going to walk after the way of the ungodly. We're not going to stand in the way of the sinner. We're not looking to that for our salvation. We're not doing what the world is doing to be saved. We're looking to Christ. Go back with me to Psalm 1. I, I was listening to an interview recently of a man that was asking a Jewish man, why don't you think that Jesus is the Messiah? And um, I have no idea about the interviewer, where he was spiritually, but I was intrigued by the question that he asked this Jewish man. And I wrote down his answer. I wrote down the Jewish man's answer, word for word. He said, because... The redemption has not yet arrived. For had the redemption arrived, we would not need to work nor do the commandments. We have to fulfill the commandments now because there has not yet lived a man who has lived in perfect joy. So it is clear that the redemption has not yet arrived. <laughs> and I thought, well, he's got some understanding. He, he, he was saying the same thing in 2017 that that woman at the well said in John chapter 4. We know 
that when Messiah comes, <laughs> when Messiah comes, everything's going to be good. He's going to lead us into all things. He's going to keep the law. Redemption's going to come. We're not going to be under the law anymore. They rejected the Lord Jesus Christ as the Messiah, not believing that the perfect life had been lived. And so they're still looking for a way, a way to God. Keep the commandments. Keep the commandments. The Lord said, no, I am the way. Don't stand. Don't stand in the way of sinners. Don't, don't, don't walk after the counsel of the ungodly. And don't sit in the seat of the scornful. What is a scornful? A scornful is a mocker, a profane person, a blasphemer. Now, the more irreligious our culture becomes, and I've noticed in my lifetime that it's become much more irreligious than it used to be, um, the more you hear people profane the Lord openly, you know, denying him and his deity. And uh, they are very scornful. They are very, uh, they're very blasphemous about those things. They deny his deity directly, openly, without shame. But their condition is no different than the religious person who denies the Lord's deity by doctrine. They call him Lord. They call him Lord, but then they say, well, you know, his hands are tied. He's really not able to do what he wants to do. He wants to save everybody, and he can't do it because, because although he's Lord, he doesn't have power over man's free will. And they are mockers. They're, they're blasphemers. They're being scornful and profane in their doctrine. They honor him with their lips in one, in one sentence, and then they dishonor him in the next, don't they? They call him Savior. They call him Savior. But they're just as profane as the irreligious man who stands and raises his fist to heaven and, and declares himself to be an atheist and curses God. They're just as guilty before God. They're just as scornful. Don't sit in the seat of the scornful. The Lord Jesus Christ didn't. <laughs> he didn't sit with them. He knew who he was. They call him Jesus, but they don't believe that he actually saved his people from their sins, which is what Jesus means. They say he's the Christ, but his ability to, uh, to, to redeem his people and to, and to establish righteousness before God is limited by man's works and by man's will. You see... Whether you deny the deity of Christ directly or whether you deny the deity of Christ by doctrine, you're being scornful. You're being blasphemous. You're cursing God. You're being profane. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. Now I know the people read Romans, uh, uh, Psalm 1, and they say, you know, don't, don't go here and don't go there and don't do this and don't do that. There's places you ought not to go. There's things you ought not to do. You know that. You don't need to be told what to do and what not to do. You need to have the power to do that which is right, don't you? Where does that come from? Not by being told what to do and not do, but by being by looking to Christ, the man, the blessed man. Blessed is that man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, who stands not in the way of sinners, who sits not in the seat of the scornful. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12. 
But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down. (laughs) You see, he didn't sit in the seat of the scornful. He sat on his own throne. (laughs) The father said, sit thou here at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And the Lord Jesus Christ took his rightful place at at the right hand of the majesty on high. He wouldn't sit with the scornful. No, the scornful denied him. And he stood all through that denial. In the passion of Christ's crucifixion, you don't hear about him sitting down anywhere. You hear hear about him being crushed. You hear about him being crucified. But sitting... No, that was reserved for after he had finished the work of redemption. Verse 14, I'm sorry, verse, uh, verse 13. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Now, every single one of us came into this world at enmity with God. God haters. Not not looking to Christ for our righteousness, looking to ourselves, denying him, profaning his glory and his deity, either religiously or irreligiously, which we think we did it. What's the Lord do? He causes us to sit at his feet, doesn't he? And uh, listen to his words. For by one offering, verse 14, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified so that he that does the sanctifying, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, and all them which are sanctified, made holy by his perfect work, are all as one. Wherefore, He's not ashamed to call them his brethren. (laughs) We have union with Christ. You see, the blessings of God are given to the man and all those who are in the man. And those that are in the man, they walk not after the counsel of the ungodly. They look to Christ for their counsel. They stand not in the way of sinners or seat in the city of the scornful. But his delight, his delight is in the law of the Lord. And again, the word law here is the word Torah. It's the whole canon of scripture. His delight, the delight of Christ. Every thought that he had was consistent with the word of God. That's not true of me and you, is it? We, when, when God writes his word on our hearts and impresses them on our minds, he gives us a love for God's word. We, we love his law. We love his word. But how many thoughts we have that are contrary to his word, the Lord Jesus Christ never experienced such. Every thought that he had... He delighted in the law of God. I delight to do thy will, O God. Thy law is written in my heart. Every thought that he had was holy. Psalm 119, when God puts his law in one's heart, he meditates on them day and night. He meditated on them all the time, didn't he? All the time. He never had a thought that was inconsistent with the word of God. And if tempted, what did he say? What did he say if tempted? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The Lord Jesus Christ was blessed of God because he delighted in the law of God perfectly all the time, all the time. And them that are found in him, they love his word. They love what it, what it reveals to them about him. They love the hope, the peace, the joy. Thy word shall be a light unto my path, a lamp unto my feet. 
of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. It, it's his word that reveals to us the glory of who he is, isn't it? And we delight. That's why you're here tonight. That's why we're here, isn't it? To see what God says about Christ. Why? Because he's put in our hearts a desire for Christ. And we know that the only way that we're going to see him is as he speaks to us through his word. The delight of the blessed man is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate. He meditates day and night. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ meditated on God's word. Well, he, was, he is the word of God. He is the word of God. All he had to do was have a thought, and it was the word of God. <laughs> You see, he, didn't have, he wasn't like us. He was holy, undefiled, separate from sinners. Every thought that he had. You know, you and I have thoughts and we've got to discern the what's right and what's wrong. All the Lord Jesus Christ had to do was think something and it was right. It was holy. It was perfect. And God blessed him for that. He was blessed of the Father. And those that are found in him, all the blessings that God gave to Christ are for all those who are in Christ. And he shall be a tree planted by rivers of water. What do we see in Revelation chapter 22? Turn with me there, last chapter of the Bible. Revelation 22. Revelation is filled with symbolic language and it all points us to Christ, doesn't it? Look at, look at verse 1 of chapter 22. And he showed me a pure river of water of life. Well, who's that river? That's, that's Christ, clear as crystal. If any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And so John gets this vision of heaven and he sees this river clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life. <laughs> the tree of life on both sides of the river. So you've got this river, you've got this tree. It's the same tree of life that was in the garden that Adam was blocked from eating from after he ate from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thinking he was going to be virtuous and have free will. And so the Lord guarded the garden with the flaming sword of an angel. Why? Because they couldn't partake of the tree of life. Otherwise they'd live forever in a sinful, broken state. They had to die. That was God's mercy keeping them out of the garden. Now what do we have? We have, we have everything restored. The Lord Jesus Christ is that blessed man who never walked in the counsel of the ungodly, never stood in the way of sinners, he never sat in the sea of the scornful. In God's law, he delighted day and night, and he's like a tree planted by rivers of living water. Producing its fruit and its leaf shall not wither. What is the hope that we are a tree, which is, as the scripture says, the planting of the Lord, a tree of righteousness? What is the hope? To be in Him? To be found in Him? He's the tree of life. Go back with me. He shall be like a tree planted by the river of water. And bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither. And whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Can you say that about yourself? Can you say everything I put my hand to is just, I, everything I touch just turns to gold. I, it just, it's just everything I do is prospers. <laughs> no. He can't. 
everything he put his hand to, prospered. And if you're in him, you enjoy the same prosperity that he has. And you're blessed. Blessed because you're in Christ. Blessed because God has revealed something of his glory in his word to you. Blessed because you know that the way of the sinner is the way of free will and good works. And that's not the way of God. The way of God is free grace and the finished work of Christ. You know that the scornful who, 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 who blaspheme him, that's, that's not that's not the blessings you know anything about, is it? The ungodly are not so. But they're like the chaff with the wind driveth away. The Lord said he takes the wheat and he brings it to the threshing floor. And what the Lord's doing, every time, every time the gospel's preached, the Lord is threshing the wheat from the chaff. Lord, don't let me be chaff. Give me ears to hear. Give me hearts to believe. Don't let me be blown away. Gather me up and put me into the barn lest I be burned in the furnace. That's, what, that's the analogy that the Lord gave, isn't it? Of the wheat and the chaff. And only he can do that. He said it's not, it's not up to man. We can't tell who the tare and the wheat are, can we? Sometimes we have a hard enough time telling about ourselves whether we're tear or wheat. He knows. He knows. The wicked, the unbelieving, they're like the chaff. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Oh, Lord, save me by your grace. Don't let this be a description of me. Cause me to be found in Christ. Reckon the work of Christ to my account. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous. He knows Christ's way. And he knows those for whom he did his way. But the way of the ungodly shall perish. If the Lord enables us, we're going to spend Wednesday nights for some time looking through the Psalms and seeing Christ in the Psalms. But these six verses, three verses and three verses, really provide a summary of everything we're going to see in more detail and glory about Christ. Um, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your word and the revelation that you've given us of thy dear Son. And we pray for the faith to, to rest our hope and our hearts in him. Thank you for the blessed man. And bless us, Lord, for Christ's sake. Amen. Let's stand together, Brother Tom. Number 18, stand. Bye.
So 